all of you. Um, as you know very well, my name is uh, Bart, and you can uh, check me out on Twitter at birthmarkbart. Got lots and lots of stuff we're going to be sharing with you today. Um, so looking forward to all that. And it looks like it is live, so that's good. Always oh, perfect. Uh, so yeah, welcome to DOK Explorers Day, day one. I wanted to get a little bit of a head start, like I said, to make sure everything was in order. Um, and it looks like everything is, so that's always good news. And, but I've had all sorts of te technical difficulties in the past, ever since I started with uh, the data on Kubernetes community um, two and a half years ago. So here we go. Let's see. Live. And for folks that are out there, please let me know if you have uh, any difficulties hearing. Uh, if there are any technical problems or things like that, let me know. Get those sorted out as quickly as possible. Um, good, good, good. Um, so if you're watching, you can start sharing this on whatever you happen to be. Um, just let folks know that we are definitely live. And I've also got a bunch of guitars behind me. Um, I don't know if you can see. And I hope to I play all of them today. Um, but it's always nice to, to start out with some live music just to, to set the tone and, and make sure that we're all, uh, we're all kind of on the same page. We got a lot of stuff that we're going to be covering today. I appreciate your patience. I am not the most technically qualified person in the world. Um, so I really ask for your patience. Um, let's see, um, that's okay. Okay. I think that's all right. Um, double checking this. I think we're okay. Want to make sure everything's all right there. Good. Um, so that being said, like I said, we, uh, we've we always been big fans of, of live music here in the data on Kubernetes community. It's been one of the things that affect our identity. Um, so, so yeah, definitely want to incorporate that as well in today's event. So I'm going to double check all this. Please let me know if... Um, if we have any technical difficulties. Oh, yes, Captain Corsair, what is up? Dude, that was super good to see you. Uh, got lots of lots of folks in the audience. I'm gonna go grab my guitar real quick. Uh. So I hope the sound works okay. And I'll adjust my camera a little bit so you can see better. Um, but uh, like I said, if there are any difficulties regarding that, please let me know. And that being uh, this guitar is my dad's guitar. Um, it's from the 1960s. Yeah, my dad's pretty old. Older than me. I know it's difficult to believe someone's older than me. I'm 37. <laughs> but this guitar is a wonderful story. Um, my dad played it just for about a year and then kind of gave up on guitar, wanted to pursue other things. And he, so my brother started playing it when he was around 14. And then friends played it because uh, my sister plays violin she's an amazing musician my brother's an incredible guitarist and band. and i'm the youngest so i got to grow up listening to them they're a big source of inspiration for me and so anyway so this guitar um has it's about like i said it's around 50 years old um even a little bit more like 60 actually closer to 60 than 50 it's acoustic uh they don't make guitars really like this anymore at least as far as i know and so I brought it with me to Spain some years ago, but it needed to be restored, right? So it's been a bit of a project. Um, not that I did. I could never do this. Um, a wonderful person helped me out with, uh, with getting it back up to speed and, and in better condition. Uh, so anyway, just going to play. I'm going to play a little bit. Just want to see how the sound is. Please let me know if you can hear. And if not, I can move you know, the microphone. Um, but yeah, that being said, uh, I'll just be checking the comments. You can let me know if, you can, if it sounds OK. Oh, hey, Karuna, what's up? Nice to see you. Does it sound okay? Um, please let me know in the comments if you can hear this or not, because it's very important that you that you do, that you're able to do so. Um, and it looks like we got that going on too. Uh, just want to make sure we've got everything all in the right place regarding the live stream. Good. We'll stop that. Make sure this keeps going here. Okay, good. Uh, oh, yeah. Playing instruments, no big deal. It's all just a question of time. All right. Just like all the stuff the explorers have been doing um, in this process uh, through learning uh, different technologies. But, uh, but yeah, it's really just a question of time and, and putting in the work. Um, but anyway, good. So I'm glad you can hear. So let's just kick this off. This is a, a tune that I call Little Birdies, all right? As a reminder that no matter where you are at any point in time, there's always a bird out there singing a song. And it's something that we can all enjoy, knowing that there's always music happening all over the world. And there's something to pay attention to 
and to make your day better for free. Um, that's great because, you know, a lot of things in life might cost a lot, but just slowing down and, and the, the natural music that surrounds us is, is really nice. So anyway, here we go. Cool. So that's a good way to start. Hope you like that. And if you didn't, I apologize. But um, I would also encourage you to take the time, find an instrument that you like, um, give it a shot, see what you think. All right. It's, uh, it's always a fun pursuit um, to be involved with. And it's something that's very, very helpful um, at, at in different times in different ways. So yeah. That being said, welcome to DOK Explorers Day. We got a lot of stuff we got to get through. I have to actually check my agenda to make it on the right page and doing all the right stuff that I'm supposed to be doing. Sometimes I have to follow my own rules. I'm uh, going to scroll down. Good. So, being said, you've got the schedule here. If at any point in time you have questions, please leave them here in the, uh, in the chat, or also you can reach out directly to the speakers in our Slack, all right? Um, so definitely keep that in mind um, as an option to make this as interactive as possible. One of the cool things about doing online events is making, you know, it's about making them inclusive, um, inclusive in different ways. Inclusive for folks that are, that are you know, newcomers or happen to not have as much experience. Inclusive in the sense it doesn't matter where we are in the world that we can all be connected here. Um, you don't have to travel anywhere. It's a way for us to, to connect people from different countries, from different cultures, speak different languages. And also, of course, too, in terms of different genders. So, you know, we really do our best. We can always do better. But that part of being inclusive is something that I think is core to this program and also core to the larger cloud native community and something that you should always keep in mind, right, with everything that you do, all right? How can, how can you make the, uh, whatever you're doing more inclusive? That being said, our, our first talk, all right, of the day is from someone who's from a, a very different country from, from a lot of the ones that we've had previous occasions in, um, in the data on Kubernetes community. And her name is Edith, all right? And she's from Peru, which is in South America, if you're not familiar. And Edith is a wonderful person who I got to meet in London not that long ago. And she's doing uh, technical evangelism and developer relations at Percona, all right? So she's going to be our first speaker. Um, please let me know if there are any difficulties with the connection or, or anything of that nature. Um, but without further ado, I'd like to kick it off with her. And let me get out of here. Let me share my screen, all right? So let's get over to Edith. Good. And let's see if this works. Please let me know if you can't hear the sound. Um, you should be able to and, and hope you enjoy Edith's talk, all right? Everyone has a different journey, a different way of getting involved. And the person I'm with today has an amazing story to share. Her name is Edith. She's doing amazing work, incredible stuff at Percona as a tech evangelist, traveling to different places, sharing the good news of open source and the things it can offer. But to know a little bit more about her story, Edith, how did you start in open source? Hi, Bar. So that's a, actually a good question. Uh, I wanted to improve my level in English. And one of the ways uh, to do it was to translate documentation from English to Spanish in the official website of Kubernetes is where, where I started. So I started by translating the documentation glossary, starting four volumes, then translating more larger texts about storage. I feel great to contribute to open source uh, because this is something really big about Kubernetes. Then I started looking for tutorials um, or some guiance uh, to find some guiance or mentoring to be involved more in open source. So it's how I found Outreachy, which was the perfect program for me to do something meaningful in open source. 
Wow. It's fantastic. And it's great because we have other people in our, you know, in our area that, that have also worked on the glossary project using their language skills yeah. to help make these things more accessible. So that's, that's great. And in, in terms of what are some tips that you would give, you know, to, to other folks that are out there who want to get involved, who want to start contributing to open source? There is many things, many tips that you also saw. Uh, on social media, uh, which I also take some of this, but this is also my own personal experience, my own opinion. So one of this is uh, if we have something in mind, some projects that already are using some kind of tools in open source, it's going to be easy to us to involve in this uh, in this open source, to start to contribute in, in, in that tool that we already know and we are already end users for that. And it's a great opportunity to research and look for the repository and start reading the contribution page. And another thing is asking questions is an important thing. Uh, questions in the pull request or in open, open issues uh, is also a way to contribute. If we have questions, uh, we should try to make it public. This is one of the things that uh, I am also learning until now. The other thing I consider important is um, to do our research first uh, before asking. If, uh, if, we are, if we are already contributing in something, doing our own research is going to help us to structure our question and explain it in better, as better as we can and also explore some solutions that we have. And uh, we are going to get better support, explain it in our own way. One of the other things, Bar, that I consider important is as uh, we ask when we get stuck. Sometimes we will try, we will we will try we try to solve things uh, by ourselves, even if this cool is, we spend a lot of time in that two hours, three hours. But putting a limit in that and asking about asking if we are stuck is important um, because we can we can we can advance in the project as a team. The other thing um, is a uh, thing that this is not a competition. This consists of contributing in the well-being of the community and also in the in the open source project. And this is uh, one of the things that I would like to share: grow our own network with genuine genuine connections in the community. Uh, people in the community will support us to improve our technical and soft skills. And when we are ready we are going to start to give back that to the community, which I consider that very, very important to grow as a human being. That's great. And, you know, in your current role with the things that you're doing, it's something that's very attractive to a lot of people. You know, how can I get more uh, experience as a DevRel? You know, what are what are good things for, for people that are out there who want to get more into this world? What would you recommend? Yeah, I feel like... Uh, this, uh, this, this role has some skills that some people has naturally. <laughs> uh, they bore with that, but other people don't. Like me, for example, I have to learn to be more social, to create content and make things. Um, I feel that if you are a person who really feels comfortable talking with others in groups, in groups and do you like to share and have a public presence to explain processes and digest information for easy consumption, I think this is good, a good role for you. But if you don't feel comfortable, uh, but you love this role so much, it may be something that requires a little bit more time to train yourself and give it a try, like I, like I did. Perfect advice. Very simple, practical advice. I've got one last question that's not related mm -hmm. to any of this. You are from <laughs> Peru, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. For for people that maybe aren't familiar, I find one of the best ways to get to know a culture or a country is through its food. What's the best Peruvian food that we should all try if we get a chance? <laughs> yeah, ceviche. Try the ceviche. It's one of my favorites. It's sea food. And I love it so much with fish and onions and lemon. It's delicious. It's fantastic. You have to try it. It's, yeah. It's, it's so good. It's just, it doesn't, yeah, it's, <laughs> and it's, it's good all year round. It doesn't matter if it's hot, if it's cold. Um, and it's something that seems simple, but I don't imagine is very simple if it's done correctly. Um, but I think it's something that people can try out there. And, and like you said, fish and seafood, very healthy things to eat. Um, so that's good to keep in mind. 
Edith, thank you very much for your time today. Yeah. Looking forward to seeing all the amazing work you're going to be doing in the future and hope to see you yeah. at KubeCon. Yeah, you too. Thank you so much for the invitation and see you there. <laughs> all right. Take care. Bye-bye. Everyone. All righty. And we're back. Uh, excellent job, Edith. Amazing speaker. Like I you know, while you're in, in watching the event, while you're enjoying DOK Explorers Day, your learnings in public, ask the speakers questions. You can do so either on Twitter or also on Slack. This is what a lot of this. Don't be afraid to ask questions, right? Don't be afraid to put yourself out there. It's always your homework as you've done in the DOK Explorers program. Absolutely anywhere you go, right? That all of this, that there's going to be an opportunity to keep quite easy to do so. I made a quick, um, but, but like I said, very, very simple. Keep going um, with that video. I will get this loaded. Go, all right. Quite practical, simple explanation. But for folks that might be new to the community or new to this, Feel free to ask questions so we can make it as easy as possible for you to get that certificate, okay? I get my video, there we go. Where are you? Sorry, I have a lot of things open right now. <laughs> you, okay. Maybe we'll just have to go to full screen and share everything real quick. Gonna technical, technical, uh, <laughs> technical <laughs> things are, are I'm going to share my, uh, let's see, where are you? Uh, not that, not a Chrome tab. Okay. So you should be able to see my entire screen now and going to get that started. Oh, but really quickly need to take myself out. Sorry about that. It looks like we're having some sound difficulties. Not a problem. We can uh, start sharing. Let's see. Nope, not now. Um, let's see. Yeah, thank you for your patience and thank you for letting me know. All right, super simple about how to get a DOK Explorers Day certificate. I hope that everyone can see this now. All right, please let me know if you're having any problems. Thank you for your patience. So getting back to the slide, very simple. In today and tomorrow, all right, and then amazing people, AI, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, streaming and messaging and analytics workloads on Kubernetes that were mentioned which is a very easy to consume resource that you can find on our website. So we want all the folks who want to get a certificate to choose one of the talks given by uploading them separately to YouTube as well. Take notes about any words or concepts that you don't know and find answers. We'll also share the slides with you so you can go through those. Um, if the talks are very short, generally between five and 10 minutes. 
right? Where are you going to find those answers? Google Kubernetes documentation questions if you're not information is going to be out there. How do you think the explorers found it, right? You can use, right? So you find answers to those questions. Then 150 to what you've learned, right? About sharing your knowledge. You can and uh, whether it's Hashnode or different blog sites or, or LinkedIn, like I said, you don't need to post anything, right? Just write, just write it in a we want you to share that in the DOK Explorers. Uh, and that way you can share with them what you're, what you're learned, what you've learned, right? They will take a look. I'd be happy to take a look as and see if there's any additional information you might need. If there are any mistakes that you may have made that they can help you with, like I said, use them as a, as a resource there. And approved, you can post it on LinkedIn. Make sure that you tag, once again, tag the Explorers. And, and you can tag me, whatever, so that we can see that it's done. So you can uh, share the, the, whatever, it's totally up to you, but just keep it simple. We can give guidance on that um, if necessary. Posted, share the link on our Slack and we'll get you your, your certificate, all right? We already have a template created. Um, we just need to see that you've done the work and then we'd be happy the work that you've done, all right? If you have any, you can ask here today in the event. You can also ask is that we want to have this done by Monday. You have, like I said, the talks are quite short. You have to get this done and with guidance and support. Just remember, don't, don't suffer in silence if you're not sure. Um, this is done in a timely manner, right? It shouldn't take too long. And, and we know that you're sharing. I'm going to get back good. Um, let's see. Uh, cool. Good, 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 good. So let's see. My voice is cutting. Okay, so some people are saying it's working. Some people are saying it's not. Uh, having difficulties here on the stream. Uh, can, you can just let me know. I'm going to go back in here and see if there's something I can adjust on the stream. One, one thing, one thing real quickly. Um, let me pull that back. Fresh here and see if we have any better. Good. Um, all right, it should be better now. I apologize for the, the difficulties there, but sometimes these things happen. Yeah, let's see. It's not one thing, it's another. Let's see. Let's see. Thanks for your patience, folks. What I need to do to get this going? Um, hmm. I might want to stop and restart this because let me figure this out. All right, cool. All right, let me figure. It should be better now. I'm hoping it's better now. Please let me know once you can start hearing me. I turn my mic back on. Um, looks like the connection has improved. Um, it's what it says here, at least on YouTube. So just let me know. Um, let me know when you can. <laughs> Do I still sound like. All right. Uh, let me know how things are going, okay? Um, while that's While we're figuring that out, Okay, good. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So sorry about that. Like I said, technical, my, not my not my strong suit. Um, now, next up, all right. So as I started the event, you know, we were talking about being inclusive. Uh, <laughs> hilarious. 
<laughs> okay, so as I as I said, you know, the importance of being, you know, inclusive in as many different ways as possible, you know, whether it's people from different countries, technical backgrounds and non-technical backgrounds. Our next speaker is Colleen Cole, and she's an incredible person who I got, also got to meet uh, when I was in London when I met Edith, right? So Colleen works at the New Stack. Um, you're probably aware of what the New Stack is. It's a publication that covers all things cloud native, uh, creative, et cetera. Um, so, so yeah, so here's, like I said, here's Colleen's, uh, Colleen's info um, to check that out. Um, but like I said, I will start sharing my screen again and hopefully don't have any problems because we don't want uh, to have any issues seeing Colleen's amazing presentation about how that started, all right, what her backstory is. So let's get over here. I'm going to make this full screen. I am lucky to know quite a few people. And this is a person I should have met a long time ago. Her name is Colleen. <laughs> She's absolutely fantastic. She does really cool stuff. And we finally got to connect recently in person at an event in London. But she's got a pretty cool story. And I think it's important that she shares it. Go for it. <laughs> well, I mean, I got into tech on a bet. It started with a conversation uh, with an, uh, an exec uh, at a company we partnered with, uh, uh, a company that I used to work with, it's, it's a software company for uh, microscopy. What we did is we uh, we were Google Maps for microscopes uh, to detect cancer. So it was, it was all, it was great. And we partnered with a software company uh, who uh, specialized in C++ and embedded software and stuff like that. So. I decided to land my branding manager um, skills for this company. That's it. I knew it was tech, intimidating, whatever. So we were invited to one of their summits in Berlin. It's nice. A lot of guys, a lot of white males. <laughs> and uh, as a brand manager helping out with the exhibit booth, I was just doing my thing. It was great. Lots of friendly people. And then you know, the after hours uh, with beers and, uh, you know, hanging out with the uh, Germans and everybody from all around the world, you know, there's a lot of guys. And so I had the liquid courage to ask, hey, where are all the women at? <laughs> where are the people that look like me? And this was to the exact great guy. Um, the company's name uh, is uh, KDAP. They're, they're fantastic, really friendly. And he gave me a nice positive answer he's like you know it, that's a great question it's our ongoing efforts it's really positive it's just you know they just you know they, they are working on their strategy I'm like oh, okay so I'm, I'm listening in and and I'm like you know what is it really that hard that was my legally blind <laughs> response is it like hard uh, he's like well no you tell me I'm like well I don't know. I always thought that tech was intimidating, uh, but do you think I could do it? He's like, I don't know. Can you? I'm like, well, I don't know. I've seen the hours. I've seen the behaviors. I've seen the silence. I've seen the concentration. I mean, I'm in marketing. What, what the heck? He's like, I think you could do it. I was like, really? He's like, I bet you could do it. I was like, okay. So <laughs> it's really weird. So I, I'm always up for a bet. And if he had that confident, that enough confidence in me, I was like, okay, that's wonderful. So two quote coding courses and Python books for dummies <laughs> later, I did it. I survived. Um, it was tougher than I thought, I, I will admit, especially on my brain. Um, actually, I would rather give birth to two sets of triplets than go through another courting. <laughs> another coding class it, it was just it was really rough but that was just to me and I think had a lot to do with my attitude going into it I probably should have had a different mindset but I did it and the the cool thing about going into tech is that somebody bet on me that I could do it even knew even though they knew I didn't really have a tech background so I kept kept that mindset after I completed it and then when I told them that I completed it he was just like overjoyed. I'm like, wow, this is a great community I want to be a part of. And ever since, I just never look back. I've always like, if there have been opportunities to go back into hospitality, I used to do stuff in restaurants and, and do event management there. But if there's an opportunity in tech, I, I will take that, you know, um, above all. So I really enjoy being in it. But it was all because of the bet. And now, because of that, because of the whole women 
and uh, misrepresented communities. I, 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 I have a passion for that. I want to make sure in my sense, if, if I'm going to do anything on this, my life lifetime here on this planet is to make sure that I make a difference and find these people who other people who can make a difference in that community to represent in tech just based on my positive experience. So that's my quick story. <laughs> okay. And for an even quicker one, yeah. what's the, what's the, if you could choose one problem and one problem only, what would it be? And what would your solution be? One problem? Yeah. What's the biggest problem that you, that you find yourself talking about all the time that people just aren't getting? I think I used to think it was my problem, but I really do think the uncomfortability that some people have based on what they see and their inexperience. That's my problem. I wish there were more people to be open-minded about people they don't understand. Like for example, I mean, this is not as quick as I would like, but if you see me you see me on the floor uh, at a conference or a showcase floor, have the opportunity to speak to me before your mindset speaks or don't go past because you're, you're missing an opportunity of something you don't know just based on your uncomfortability um, to uh, expand and to, um, I don't know, acknowledge even. I mean, I, we're not all stereotypes. I'm guilty of it too sometimes, I think. Um, I do it with some women. I'm surprised, but I'm not afraid. That's what I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get more people to do. Just get out of your, your, uncomf your um, uncomfortability. Is like, go and ask these people, hi, are you, what are you doing here? What's your place here? And I find out, I, I met so many <laughs> founders and CEOs and women and uh, people of color that are doing great things that I had no idea, but and then some uh, white males as well that are doing other things that I had no idea because I probably put them somewhere. But I'm not afraid anymore just because uh, the uncomfortability that I used to have in asking because it was intimidating to me um, because it was tech and I, was, I didn't have that tech background. So that's the problem I have is that I think more people should, should not be intimidated or be uncomfortable to talk to people like me that don't look like themselves. That's great. Thanks, Vin. Lots to learn. <laughs> and and lots, this is, you know, unfortunately a very short conversation that could go much further. You're 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 out there, you're fighting the good fight, you're being public about it, you don't back down. And I think that's a very, very strong message and encouraging for people, regardless mm -hmm. of their background. And we can all learn a lot by letting our guard down a little bit and not just jumping to those quick assumptions. So Colleen, yep. I thank you. Well, Bart, that's how I met you. I saw you, I'm like, who the hell is this guy? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta meet him. <laughs> he's, he's on LinkedIn and sunglasses and rapping about data on Kubernetes. <laughs> I'm like, I gotta get to know this guy. <laughs> Somebody said something about yeah. sunglasses. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yes, I appreciate yeah. that. Embrace, embrace your differences, and and don't hide. And don't feel ashamed about anything. So yeah, that's great. Okay. Thank you very much, Colleen. Thanks, Pleasure. Bart. Cheers. All right. Well, if you didn't know Colleen, now you do, and you can understand why. She's got so many fans. All right, sticking to her. And, and, and not being afraid to share them publicly, all right, which is sometimes difficult and, and for a lot of different reasons. But like I said, she's a very, very strong example. Check out all the stuff that she's doing. She's very, very active. Always doing amazing work. Um, so yeah, definitely. Someone I've learned a lot from for quite a long time. In person, like I said, since, uh, you know, only much longer ago in terms of uh, different areas, just seeing all the work, you know, his background, his age, and context, doing a lot. Of Waha, all right, if you're not familiar with him, very, very active in the cloud native ecosystem, in the CNCF, um, all things related to open source and creating content. I know it's been a big source of inspiration for a lot of folks out there.
participated in various uh, moments throughout um, the community's history. I want to share, um, I asked him to, to give a talk and, and he accepted. And so his, his talk is about practical. So I, I encourage you to listen up. Questions going. Don't be afraid to to you know to once again. We're all here to learn. Um, learning in public is what we're all about. I will get my get my microphone off, and that way we can start with Kunal. Let's go. Don't given it is uh, Explorers Day. I mean, it's so nice to see how far the community has come now. I just remember still I used to you know work with Bart when we were. Uh, like launching the new interns and stuff. Uh, shout out to Kunal Verma, Vanshika, and uh, Kevalia and everyone else who were like the very first ones. And now I see this on social media, how the program has grown quite a lot and you're helping so many other people. So excited uh, excited for this and um, amazing, uh, amazing event, amazing initiatives by the UK for the student community. So everything was going fine. And then we got back into Lagland. <laughs> Uh, and here in Bardobot and Kunalobot. So let me let me get rid of a couple of tabs here and there, and and let's see if that helps it improve. Uh, let's see. This is you know the price of doing too many things simultaneously. Uh, you know multitasking is a good thing. Good. Let me get out of. Um, I'll go editing movie. Oh, let's get this out. Let's get this out. Let's get this out improve things a bit and then you can let me know if the lag if the lag uh has left us all right so let's try this again let me make sure we get Kunal. oh poor kunal has got his eyes closed uh, really excited to present and um it's so nice to see how i used to you know work with Bart when we were uh, like launching the new interns and stuff. Uh, shout out to Kunal Verma, Vanshika and uh, Kevalia and everyone else who were like the very first ones. And now I see this on social media, how the program has grown quite a lot and you're helping so many other people. So excited, uh, excited for this and um, amazing, uh, amazing event, amazing initiatives by the UK for the student community. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, my experiences and uh, basically share some of the mistakes to avoid, some of the tips when getting involved in uh, communities and uh, my biggest learnings uh, as well. So before we get started, let me share a little bit more about why you should get involved in communities. So if you're a beginner, not just let's say a student, but let's say a beginner, you're looking for a job in tech and you're looking to, let's say, enhance your experiences, you're looking to get some um, you know, feedback on your projects, you're looking to uh, build your profile, portfolio, a resume, and all sorts of things. Getting involved in communities can help you quite a lot. And the amazing thing that has happened in the past few years is the, you know, uh, more awareness around folks working remotely, because this gives companies an opportunity to hire global talent. And if you're from a country where, you know, uh, let's say there are not many in-person opportunities or there's like a, a lower pay, for example, um, working for a country, you know, like a global company in some other country, oftentimes can be a little bit, uh, well, to be honest, pretty amazing. Again, I'll give an example, let's say you're working from India for a company based in the US. So the amount of, let's say the salary that you get and uh, the, the people that you get to collaborate with uh, from like a global community and I think it's, uh, it's really awesome and um, yeah, getting involved in open source and communities can basically help you in getting there is basically what I'm saying. So ideally, uh, in order to get started, you have to identify, first of all, which community do you want to be a part of, what do you want to you know contribute in, what are your interests, and find the communities that align to those interests. I think that's a good way to start. Now, where do we find these communities? Good question. Uh, you can find them in open source, like open source projects. You can go to GitHub, you can go to says, Google, some GitHub projects according to your tech stack. Okay, uh, find projects in Java that are open source projects and you'll find, okay, found this um, community. Like for example, I just Googled 
Java open source projects when I was in freshman year. And I found uh, Red Hat middleware. So uh, you, you just Google like monitoring and distributed systems or whatever, like uh, machine learning and you know, like blockchain or like data on Kubernetes, anything you're doing, it's Google and you will find open source projects or communities from that. If that's not going to work for you, it will work because so you can find everything on Google. But just in case you need more information, then you can attend events, right? So you can attend KubeCon stuff and DOK events and uh, all sorts of things. Local meetups, go to meetup.com. You can find tech meetups there. From there, you can find experienced people learn from their experiences and see like, okay, what are some other communities that I can get involved in. Now, mistakes to avoid. Um, specifically also around open source contributions. The biggest mistake that I see people make is not having patience. And you have to realize that the success that you'll get or the benefit that you'll see via contributing to open source or getting involved in communities, it's not gonna happen overnight. When you see someone like, oh, that student is like uh, giving a nice talk at a big tech conference. Why can't I do that? So don't have that feeling. Instead of the feeling of competition or jealousy, you should uh, replace that with the motivation and you know, like inspiration. So when you see someone succeed, oftentimes people just ignore the journey and they just see the good things. Um, you cannot even count how many times I have been rejected for a job. So many times. So talked to so many people when I was like in second year or something, got so many rejections. But in the end, what matters is that one acceptance that you get. And then you can scale your career from there and learn as you grow, gain more experiences. So that was mistake number one. Mistake number two also personally that I have made is doing too many things at once. So <laughs> people often ask me, Kunal, you do so many things. You know, when you were when you were a student, like when I was a student that you they used to ask. And to be quite frank, yeah, a little bit of a burnout. That happens now that I have a full-time job. I'm really focused on you know the amount of community work that I do. Um, so I'd highly recommend not getting burnt out and not uh, doing too many things at once. Instead of you know putting little little efforts everywhere, uh, ideally it's great to put uh, a lot of efforts like give your hundred percent at some dedicated places. So that way you will have like more impact. Is basically what I'm saying. Right. So some of the mistakes to avoid. Uh, three tips if I can give you. Um, for getting involved in open source and communities. Let's say you found your community. Tip number one, pretty straightforward. And the most important tip, read the code of conduct. It's very, very important. So I'm just going to put it there. Code of conduct is like a, basically like a rules and regulations you have to follow. Uh, tip number two, research before asking a question. Now, this is not just... This is actually, in the end, benefiting you only. Okay, because some people are like, hey, I got, I got a message in a Slack channel recently. Uh, the Commodore community, shout out to Commodore. So in the Slack channel, they have a public community. I got a message. Hey, Kunal, I'm stuck in this open source project. Can you please help me out? I was like, okay, uh, I will help you out, but can you please help me out on the page number? I'm not able to understand page number 35 of this book that I'm reading. And that's the only information I will give you. I will not tell you what book I'm reading. I will not tell you what I'm getting stuck on. I will not tell you, you know, what I tried, you know, to resolve that issue and how I'm facing that issue. So in the end, it's going to help you only because if you give enough context in your on, in your question, it will make it easier for other people to answer your question. Okay, so research before asking a question and then form your question in a nice way. Hey, Kunal or whatever, I'm facing this issue. This is what I tried. This is what it led to. This is what I'm trying to achieve. Do you have any suggestions? And don't like DM people in like, obviously if you know someone, if it's like a personal thing, you can DM. But for general questions, ask in public, that again will benefit you only because two reasons. More number of people will see that question. And reason number two, uh, if it's already answered, you will get your answer pretty quickly. So that's tip number two. Tip number three is give back. When you reach a certain level, when you're involved in a community, so you're now a maintainer of the open source project that you start contributing to. Then I just recommend give back, give back to the community and give back as much as you can. So those were three tips, you know, that can uh, help you. Again, uh, you can make your own tips, you know, like I said, give back. So you'll have some experiences, you'll have some learning. So share those forward with people. And my biggest learning is that there is no right time to contribute or get involved. You can get involved right now, today. If you don't know anything about, let's say that core tech stack or whatever, you can get started, you know, as a learner, you can... Be an advocate, you can um, do non-code contributions, improve the documentation, start with good first issues, just get started with learning or just show up, you know, get involved. So 
yeah, that's basically about it. Uh, you can start today. You don't have to be an expert and you can learn on the go. You can learn while contributing. It's one of the best ways to learn. Hope you have a great time at the event and uh, in the DOK community. If you have any questions, you know, there's the amazing uh, Slack channel in DOK. Again, I have already mentioned how to ask good questions. So hopefully you will ask good relevant questions with action items or enough research and uh, make it easy for people to, you know, answer. But yeah, and uh, yeah, that's basically about it. Have a good one. Bye. Okay. Very good. Excellent. So you learned a lot of really practical stuff there from learning, right? Questions that you would like to ask that you maybe haven't had answered yet. As you know, that you've done some homework, that you've done some research. And that I'm, um, and, and make it easier. Okay. What are you offering? Um, those are those want to keep in mind there. Next up, right, we're going to be getting more into the technical content and an intro. And it's always good to refresh. Mm -hmm. So one of our community members, um, Sajan, created this wonderful intro, and I'm going to share that now. All right. As usual, please let me know if you or things of that nature. I'm going to start sharing it. And I will Today we are going to discuss about what is Kubernetes in running a hotel with multiple rooms and you need to manage reservation, room cleaning, maintenance tasks. You could manually manage these tasks, but it would be time consuming and prone to errors. Instead, you decide to have a hotel management system that could automate these tasks and ensure that everything runs smoothly, exactly how Kubernetes work. Kubernetes act as a hotel management system. And just like hotel management system have components, Kubernetes also has components. So let's discuss about hotel management system components. So first, we have front desk where guests check in and check out of hotel. We have housekeeping, which manages cleaning and maintenance of each room. We have maintenance, which handle any repair or maintenance tasks such as uh, repairing a light bulb. We have kitchen, which manages the food and beverage service for guests. We have security, which ensure that hotel is safe and secure. Now, let's map these components to Kubernetes. So, first, we have the API server, which acts as a front desk of Kubernetes, where which manages the overall state of cluster and handles requests from users and other components. We have housekeeping, which is like the Kubernetes scheduler, which ensures that the containers in terms of hotel, these are rooms, are placed in appropriate nodes in terms of hotel, these are floors, based on resources, availability, and scheduling constraints. We have maintenance. This is like the Kubernetes controller manager, which ensures that the desired state of the cluster is maintained by continuously monitoring and reconciling the actual state. We have kitchen, which is like the Kubernetes deployment which manages the creation and scaling of multiple replicas of application. In terms of hotel, these are menu items across the cluster. Security, this is like Kubernetes security features such as RBAC or rollback access control and network policies, which ensure that the cluster is safe and secure. So thanks for attending. Have a nice day ahead. All right. Perfect. Perfect. Excellent job, Sajan. Wonderful, succinct explanation. It's always good to refresh this as we know it can be challenging. To take it more to the part about data on Kubernetes, all right? All right, a great way to get a feel for is used by all of the explorers is our research report, all right? This sort of explains the groundwork what it's what it's all about all right so all there's are very well versed in this they know it all too well uh, they you know have done various assignments on it and you can download it for totally free and explains you know, it's, a, it's a, um pictures things of that nature and, and graphs with percentages so nothing difficult to follow there we also have a couple of videos on our youtube channel um 21 report. So if you want to go back a little bit over 500, about 500 Kubernetes users, an opportunity of running data on Kubernetes.
Um, we also have additional talks um, that are that very much that the Kubernetes was originally designed by designed with stateless workloads in mind, right? And not the data itself. Then over time, um, to running data on Kubernetes, and that's how this community got started, right? In July of 2020, I got lots of stuff since then. For if you want to get a better idea about that, like I said, the Explorers talks today are what's really going to fill you in. Um, and we have lots of other resources in the community that you can consume, whether it's on YouTube, whether it's blogs, whether it's posts, things of that nature. Um, so never, never feel you know hesitant or shy about, about asking those Shwaha kindly explained about the best ways to ask questions. Silence, um, get those things. Probably aren't the first person to have those doubts, all right? So that means that, that there's definitely going to be an answer, all right? Things that we're going to be looking at today. Um, we, you know, the explorers have focused their efforts of AI and ML, and also operators, uh, street. Our first you want to get the certificate. This is what we're going to be. You take a look at it. You write down the things that you don't know. We will give you access to the slides. You'll have access to all of them once, uh, once DOK Explorers Day is over. All the videos from tomorrow, available tomorrow, right? And that's how from one of the DOK Explorers is from Hamis. The Fast and the Furious, how message queues keep. Um, it's just a four minute talk. You should give one. We want to make this as easy as possible. You shouldn't have to be worrying about giving an hour long talk if you've never done one that's 10 or five minutes those initial experiences are where they're working, okay? Um, so that being said, I will start sharing my screen and we will hope that And welcome to the Data on Community Day 2023. In this presentation, we are going to explore how message queues can enhance the efficiency and effectiveness of AIML workloads. Here's a little introduction about me. So my name is Samis, and I'm an undergraduate student from India, currently in my freshman year. And I'm also a community manager at Vmake Labs. Let us start off with the importance of AIML and message queue services. According to the DOK report 2022, 50% of the responding organizations run the AIML workload on Kubernetes. And close to 40% of the responding organizations run their messaging services on Kubernetes. So what are message queues and why are they important? Before you dive deeper into the topic, let me share a fun fact about message queues. Did you know that a single autonomous vehicle can generate up to 4 TB of data per day? To put things into perspective, if you were to listen to 4 TB of music at a rate of 3 minutes per song, take you over 9 years to complete it. Now imagine there are hundreds and thousands of search cars sending TBs of data to the server simultaneously. Chaos, right? This is where message queues help us. Essentially, each car is sending large volume of data that needs to be processed in real time to the server. Without a message queue, the server may struggle to keep up with the influx of data and it may even lead to a loss of data or system overload. So message queues are just as a conveyor belt. They move the data from one system to another for processing. So where does Kubernetes come into play here? For example, RabbitQ is a message service 
and Kubeflow is an AI ML service that could, that can run on Kubernetes. So what are the advantages of using Kubernetes? There are multiple, but mainly here are three that are highlighted. First is resource utilizations. Kubernetes is like a, is like a personal trainer for your AI ML workloads. It makes sure they are working out at maximum efficiency. It allocates resources automatically with the required components. Second is scalability. Kubernetes can auto scale depending on the demand of the system. And last is high, Kubernetes is highly available, meaning it, is, it always makes sure that your system is running and it is fault tolerant. And you can read more about how data is run on Kubernetes and why it is important in the DOK report of 2022. The link is mentioned in the comment. Lastly, you can also find me on this socials mentioned here. And I also write blogs on hummies.hashpan.dev. You can check that out as well. To further continue these conversations, you can join us Slack on this link below. Thank you. Excellent job, Hamiz. Absolutely fantastic explanation. Very practical. Making accessible is exactly what we're doing. Not easy being the first, you know, Explorer speaker, right? So that was definitely great presentation, great slides, very well explained. Easier for I shared um, Hamisa's uh, Twitter on uh, in the in the chat here, so you can you can follow him, you can tag him, you can uh, send screenshots. Dok Slack and all the other uh, links that he. As I mentioned previously, you know the talks that we're focusing on today, are and streaming, and as you also saw uh, messaging. Um, but our next talk is going to be about the future of real-time data, all right? So we've got Saja, all right, nice, clean, five-minute talk. I'm going to turn my camera off, and we'll get his talk started. So remember, keep taking screenshots, keep asking questions. Hello, everyone, and I welcome you all to Talk Community Explorer program. So today we are going to discuss about the topic uh, stream. We are going to discuss about streaming, data streaming, streaming technologies. So let's go. So before going to the topic about me, so my name is Sachin Yadav and I'm currently in my freshman year and uh, I'm a tech lover and a passionate learner currently exploring the field of DevOps and I am part of Talk Community Explorer program. So what is streaming? So streaming refers to the uh, delivery of audio, video, and multimedia content over internet. Unlike traditional methods where we need to download the whole video, then, then only we are able to watch it. No. Even if the small part of your video is downloaded, you are good to go and watch it. So what are different types of streamings? So we have video streaming, audio streaming, data streaming, gaming streaming, live streaming, and many other different types of streaming. Right? But our focus is data streaming. So let's move when streaming used everywhere you are watching videos you are playing games you are messaging someone you are cooking a car right everywhere you are using streaming concept of streaming so what are streaming workloads so streaming workload refers to the services and uh technologies applications that handle large amount of real-time data being sent and received as stream so means these workloads are typically used in situations where low latency and high throughput communication is required. Low latency means the time difference between data sent and data received should be very small. High throughput communication means the path chosen to send the data should be as small as possible. Uh, so moving ahead, how do Kubernetes come into picture? So Kubernetes does not directly solve the problem of streaming. It provides a platform for deploying and managing of tools and technologies that do so. Just like we have streaming technologies, which do think these things, so before talking about these technologies, we need to discuss the challenges of processing streaming data, right? We have data velocity, maybe the data is coming with very high velocity, which makes it difficult to analyze at real time. 
we have data volume maybe the data volume is very huge and it is very difficult to handle that much huge data we need to scale our system according to need maybe we need allocate more resources but are using less then there is a wastage of resources we need to take care of that in terms of latency we have just talked about that we need low latency communication then it makes a problem and security and privacy maybe the data streaming how can we show that the data is secure so these are the problems so where comes the popular streaming technologies which solve these problems right which provides a platform <clears throat> for streaming so we have different popular streaming technologies such as apache kafka apache flink apache pulsar we have red panda rabbit and so many other technologies right so is there any physical use of these technologies yes so apache kafka and apache pulsar are building blocks of real time data stream platforms right these platforms are using it live kafka is used uh, is used as a building block of linkedin uber netflix and you can see the for pulsar same uber is using for booking tickets tracking live their drivers drivers right so moving ahead what are the best practices of running streaming workloads so uh, resource management right we need to allocate uh, like cpu memory and storage effectively to ensure that the container running the streaming workloads have enough resources to run efficiently right networking we need a network which is optimized for low latency high throughput communication we have just talked about scalability we need to implement auto scaling so as to ensure there is no wastage of resources data persistence we need to have a backup because without backup if there is a failure occur we are done we need something right security we need to implement segmentation encryption and access control like these things to ensure security so is there any future of streaming and streaming technologies and platforms yes we have so uh, in terms of edge computing 5g networks ai ml cloud native multi cloud and hybrid cloud right 5g networks which provides a very high speed network for low latency high throughput communication ai ml we are using it in a live in uh, uh, in cases such as predictive maintenance for detection real time personalization in streaming platforms we can use it in terms of cloud native cloud native architecture and containerized applications provide scalable and flexible infrastructure right so we are uh, is there any stats for it whatever i said yes dokc 2022 research reports which clearly states that streaming and messaging workloads are being running on kubernetes and they are 39% of them total respondents right so this is the proof so if you want to talk more about join our streaming channel in the dokc slack and don't forget to read the dokc 2020 research report thanks for joining today and have a nice day All right, all right. I think it's time that we need to kick in a little bit of media here. I've been I've been slow on this. Let's go. <laughs> Excellent job, Sajan. All right, wonderful explanation and all done in a very concise way. Right? Easy to follow, easy to the folks that were asking in the chat about that they would like to give talks to. Most of the folks that you're gonna be seeing today. Some are very active, like Bilal has been, you know, creating lots of content for a while, but others are giving talks for the first time and they're doing a really, really good job. If you want to do the challenge to get the certificate um, into a talk, right? Just like the ones you've seen today, easy. And that way you get that experience for the rest of their lives so they can show people that they can take any concept and put it into simple terms and deliver it um, with good communication. Next up, all right, we've got Harsh Mishra, all right, who did his talk about all about. All right, let's take a look. Keep the questions going. And Perfect. Let's get this started. So hi, everyone. Welcome you all to DOK Explorer State 2023. I hope you're all doing well, and let's get started. So I'm Harsh, and, and I'm currently a mentee under Linux Kernel Mentorship Program. And I love playing around with cloud native technologies. I recently got my hands dirty on Kubernetes, and this made me excited. So 
So today's topic of discussion is messaging in Kubernetes, and we need to understand that why it is so important. So to start with, I'll share you some statistics. So Data on Kubernetes community does an annual survey where we actually interview the respondents who are running their data workloads on Kubernetes on various enterprise requirements and all other stuff that's relevant. So we surveyed industry leaders who were running the streaming and messaging workloads on Kubernetes. And 96% of them said that they were satisfied by deploying them on KS. Out of these 96 persons, 55 persons were highly satisfied with what Kubernetes had to offer them. So let's start with a simple question. So how do microservices communicate in Kubernetes? So you might have guessed, uh, they send messages. Yeah, they send messages. Messages via API endpoints. Requests and responses by API endpoints as messages, that's it. There are various ways you can do this. You have this well-known HTTP REST standard, which is you know the de facto standard for most APIs that we are seeing today. Then you have another one, which is the gRPC. Then there's this. There are these well-known message brokers you have, like RabbitMQ, etc. So you might say, "Ha, ah, that's pretty obvious. Why should I need to bother about it?" Well, let's look at a problem statement. Suppose I want to build a distributed system. So what I do, I have two services, right? I'll keep track of the connections of the communication pathways, or rather I should say the API endpoints that I need to manage for communication between all the services. I need one connection if I have two services. I add one more, I need three connections. I add another one, I need six connections. I add one more, I need 10 connections. And I'll keep on adding and these connections will increase. And now mind you, let me remind you here, all these endpoints right now, the type of architecture that I'm showing you is all managed by the application. That means the application developer needs to ensure that communication is how communication is going to be there with each and every service, how many endpoints they need to manage between two services. So to simplify this, I've actually plotted a graph for you. So you can see here for Two, as less as 200 services, we have scaled up to 20,000 connections. And most of the enterprises today run thousands of microservices over Kubernetes. And then if I need to manage these many number of connections, man, I'm in real trouble. Yes, the IT operations team is in real trouble. Your applications developers are going, are going to be in real trouble. And they'll be doomed. And of course, the very essence of Kubernetes, Kubernetes was designed to make distributed systems easier. And then if you have to run 10,000 uh, microservices over Kubernetes, you are managing a humongous number of connections. That's the problem. And if you have ever taken a computer science course, you can actually easily figure out that the growth rate of the number of connections given the number of services is O of n squared, which is not feasible, which is not feasible, either technically and from enterprise point of view as well. And in fact, what we have achieved in this architecture, scaling up to thousands of services is complete chaos. Why am I saying chaos? First off, the biggest challenge in this architecture is maintaining a coordination between the services. Then, uh, being able to troubleshoot these services when there is a bug or there is a failure. Suppose there is a failure, uh, you have 10,000 services and then there is a failure in one service due to which the whole distributed system uh, shuts down. Now, how are you going in production, in production, how are you going to check where, the, where did things go wrong, right? Which endpoint failed? You have nine 1999 connections to check in each of the 10,000 services to figure out what failed. And that's what chaos is. And in fact, it can be a security concern. Let's see a hypothetical scenario. For example, I am running a social media website and a user wants to update his profile picture, right? And due to, uh, and due to some bug, 
what happens the profile picture gets updated even before the request from the user's device is authorized by another service which was actually responsible for authorization and authentication this is a hyper hypothetical scenario but it's perfectly possible right given you have a bug or you have some sort of failure if you if you run on this architecture and this is a security concern this can be utilized by malicious attackers to compromise your systems so how do we solve all these problems well let's welcome message queue so i'm not going into formal definitions right now you can read it um, so what i'll focus on two points is that it's a central point for asynchronously sharing messages right so i'm going to focus on these two keywords central point and asynchronous so what we need is that we need some sort of a middleman which can manage all these connections for us and all the communications for us and that is what is achieved by message queue a message queue in itself has a lot of queues inside it and these queues are generally called topics now what happens is uh, every topic connects two distinct types of services and these services on the one end you have services called the producers on the other hand you have services called the workers what producers are producers take in the request from other uh, services or takes in the, the request from users and publishes that request on the message queue now what message queue does is it's very much like a queue right in uh, suppose you want to buy tickets for a movie in a cinema hall what happens you stand in a queue the one who gets first in the queue gets the ticket first that's in first in and first out and that's the very essence of a message queue these producers publish messages in the queue and these workers pick up these messages one by one process it and then uh, then either serve the response to the users or if that data needs to be sent to other services it's sent now coming to the point of asynchronous um, communication suppose even though your application might not be designed for uh, asynchronous for serving asynchronous requests but with message queues you can actually turn your synchronous applications into asynchronous ones suppose let let me show you via this diagram right you have these producers one producer can be my server in india the other producer can be my server in the us the third producer can be my server in australia now what happens requests from these users come in and they are published into the message queue now you have the replicas of various uh, of the other worker service many replicas of it that are running now these these messages are distributed by the message queue among these workers right such that no worker takes in all the requests it does all the load balancing by itself that's called scheduling all the scheduling is being managed by it and this actually ensures consistency it ensures that your resources are not overloaded so you can actually have greater response times as well now since more than one request is being taken up by the worker services and is processed at the same time you can have asynchronous communication how cool is that even though your application was not designed to be asynchronous in fact if i zoom out in this architecture what app from the application developers point of view what they need to really manage now is the connection between their service and the message queue that's it so in effectively they need to manage as many connections as there are services that is for n services i will have n connections that means i can scale linearly i don't need to worry about how i am going to communicate with the all other services in the architecture because all that hassle is taken up by the message queue it's responsible for all my scheduling it's responsible for all my load balancing it's responsible for all my connections it's it's doing all that stuff how great is that now as i talked about asynchronous uh, 
uh, asynchronous requests. So that will actually enhance the user experience as well. Because now my service is asynchronous, I can have faster response times, I can have slower wait times. And coming to the security part, what we have actually enabled is eventual consistency. So let me break this down for you. What eventual consistency is that no, you, uh, no data entity will be served to the users once it has been updated on all nodes across the network. It means, uh, that is that if uh, uh, an update is being done, right? They, let's take that example of profile picture. Until and unless my request my, has been authorized by the authentication service, my profile picture will not be updated. It will not, and that change will not be replicated across all the servers. And once my profile picture has been updated, it will not be shown to the users until and unless that change has been replicated across all the servers. So what it is uh, effectively giving you, it's giving consistency in terms of your data. You are, you are actually maintaining your data integrity as well. How cool is that? Let's talking of some implementations. You have uh, yeah, some in-house uh, message queues such as RabbitMQ, very famous one. And then you have Kafka. Well, Kafka is much more than a message queue, but it can be used as a message queue. And then you can use in-memory databases such as Redis as message queues as well. But like every engineering solution, message queues come with their own problems. And running message queues on Kubernetes, specific, specifically on Kubernetes, is not easy. Because, you know, Kubernetes was designed for microservices. And what are microservices are light. They are stateless. They are horizontally scalable. But message queue, on the other hand, has to manage scheduling, has to manage uh, how messages are being distributed, has to do a lot of processing. That means it's resource heavy. And then if it's dealing with data, it's managing messages, and that data has to be stored somewhere then it, it, it has to um, compensate for the response times as well all that stuff means it needs some sort of data storage that means that makes it stateful and if it's stateful that means it's going to be vertically scalable and this is very much different from for what kubernetes was originally designed for and that makes it a little challenging to deploy message queues on Kubernetes. And there are mitigations for the same. Right? If, if you've been there with the DOK Explorer stay uh, since the beginning, there have been talks on operators as well, and we have been covering operators for a long time. Make sure to check it out. Uh, so what operators actually allow you that uh, it, they actually ease off a lot of deployment stuff. Right? For example, I want to uh, uh, I want to deploy uh, RabbitMQ message queue on my distributed system. What I need, I need stateful sets. I need to configure deployment. I need to configure my persistent volume games. I need to configure my stateful sets and a lot of other stuff. And then all this does not have does not cover the edge cases that can happen or the network failures that can happen. So all this application level intelligence is baked in into operators and this can be managed by operators, making it easy to deploy and it will take, in, take care of all the edge cases that can happen. How cool is that? But there is an even better solution that I'm going to show you is going is using something that is tightly integrated with Kubernetes. Introducing KubeMQ. It's a CNCF project and it's a native kids message queue. So being native means that I don't need to get into the hassle of too much configuration because it's already built in with Kubernetes. And that means I can have a lot of day one convenience. And being native means that it's being Kate's native implies that it's optimized to run with Kubernetes. And if it's optimized, it's going to be lightweight. And if it's going to be lightweight, it can save a lot of enterprises resources on the cloud and especially for the enterprises which are running on multi-cloud ecosystems it can actually reduce the total cost of ownership and best of all that this message queue is designed to be extensible right you can connect to a variety of other applications and services 
reducing the need for custom integrations. And this is achieved by a lot of connectors like bridges, targets, and sources. So yeah, that was a lot, uh, folks. Um, so if you want to go into more details or want to learn how is data on Kubernetes revolutionizing the cloud native space, uh, you should get our hands on the 2022 report. And for further queries, I'm available on Slack. Go hit the link in the description, join our community Slack, and I'm going to answer all your queries there. You can contact me on my social handles here. So thank you all for joining in, and I hope you enjoyed the session. Ta-da! All right, excellent job, wonderful talk, very, very well explained, and I think we all learned a lot. Keep the questions going, folks, all right? Keep the learning in public. Entertainment break schedule is gonna be quite Anyway, just love the conversations happening here. I think, I think we can all agree that Harsh did an amazing job, super well explained, very easy to follow slides, like I said, that's what this is all about. So just real quick, uh, I'm going to play something, and then we'll get our next talks uh, loaded up, which will be from previous interns that we've had. Seeing stuff that they're doing. All right. Uh, hopefully, in order to have, I think we can, I think we can play a little bit of music. That's I can't, I'll try to follow the chat as best I can to see what's uh, going on there. All right. Um, but yeah. Well, hopefully that worked out okay. Uh, moving, like I said, we we wanted to. Uh, and participate in many all the great stuff that they're doing nowadays in many different working with uh with young people in around july of 2021 so almost two years ago and our first cohort of of interns was made up of four wonderful people and you could very active and the first one that we're going to very much looking for, but I've been interacted with a lot online. And a very brave person who is not a from her now. And I know that you're going to get a lot of practical. One who's 
maybe a few steps ahead in different ways, right? And how she got there, right? What have been the tips and tricks that she can offer folks that are at, at a different point in their cloud native? Her on screen, let me turn off my camera. Let's see, make this full screen. My time was a data dog and Kubernetes community intern. And she found us and reached out in a very interesting way, but I'll let her tell that story. So Karina, let folks who you are, uh, let folks know who you are and a little bit about what you're doing right now, but also about how you found out about the data on Kubernetes community and just the unique approach that you used uh, when you applied. Oh, so, okay, okay. So uh, data on Kubernetes community, I found it through uh, VMake devs, which was community classroom back in that time. And I was like involved in pretty much so many communities and I found this community super interesting with like having Bart doing music plus having tech. So it was a really nice combo. And when I read the application of data on Kubernetes for interns, uh, there was a line say, be creative. So I went, uh, went ahead and recorded myself uh, giving a rap, doing a rap and that's how I did my application to data on Kubernetes. Apart from that, I did some illustrations, uh, gave a talk on the OK Explorers Day, and uh, I was also part of the transcript team. So I helped folks get onboarded and help with the transcripts too. That's what I did in my intern time. Very good. Now, uh, tell us a little bit more about what you're doing now and what's been you know your biggest victory up until this point. Uh, so after DOK, I got into major league hacking. So I was like into hackathons and all stuff from the beginning and I got the chance to work with them. So they uh, asked me to apply as a coach and I really didn't think that I would get into it because, uh, like I, me being an introvert, even when on calls, I used to be like, Oh, this, <laughs> but yeah. So that was my biggest victory. Like, so I went so out of my, uh, comfort zone and I learned a lot of stuff even though that was a short period of time in which I have worked with folks but I met thousands of people in that time and learned a lot uh, learned how to communicate learned how to do stuff in like uh, a way out of this computer world and it was super super fun very good I know you said you, you touched on, you know, being an introvert and, and some of the, you know, the challenges and learning experiences there. Is there anything that you would say, what's been, you know, the biggest challenge or something that, um, that you know, that you got through and, and what you learned through that process? Sure. So, um, biggest challenge for me was to get out as out of my comfort zone, uh, which was probably like, I hesitate to talk to people like a lot. Then I went on doing conferences, like even if it, if, even if it's virtual, I like stammer a lot or maybe forget my words or happens a lot. Like I get nervous. Even when I started to speak on video calls, I used to be like, oh, shaky, shaky. And, <laughs> and now it's been a like nice journey from where I was to where I am. So I can easily go on up on stage and talk to people, give a talk and do stuff. So that's great. That's fantastic. I'm proud of myself with that. <laughs> and you should be. And with that in mind, um, you're giving a talk in KubeCon, right? Tell us about that. Yeah. Uh, sorry? No, tell us about your talk in KubeCon. Okay. You're gonna, yeah. Uh, the talk on KubeCon, right? Uh, so the, this talk is a lightning talk. So I got into technical writing recently with GSORT and I was also contributing to a CNCF glossary in between. And I found a few ways uh, where like students who want to contribute to code are not able to do that because they think, oh, this issue is so big, this code base is so big. But I found a way to do that using technical writing. So in technical writing, uh, basically you learn about stuff and you explain it to them, right? So in that way, you learn more about what it, whatever you wanted to learn. And even from that, you can uh, try making some, uh, small code samples. So by doing it, you are also doing code. And slowly and steadily, once you like understand stuff by writing, 
you will get into code and you can do code contributions too so that's how in a, as in an abstract way my talk would be fantastic that's great and you know you now have quite a bit of experience for folks that don't have that much experience what's the best piece of advice you can give to people that are you know getting started on their kubernetes journey cloud native journey uh best piece of advice i uh, uh right ask right questions and getting started is a bit overwhelming we all know that but uh when you find a right person who can guide you do not leave them keep on asking questions and don't uh, hesitate to think that uh hey i'm not getting this or you might feel like you are in the square one still now like you might have progressed a bit but you still feel that i am still on square one that's okay your progress might be slow but you are doing gradual progress so don't forget about that keep give a pat of back on your back and keep doing what you're doing you will do great it's wonderful advice and and very practical as you said for a lot of people it can be overwhelming but be patient give it time try to focus on finding the right person and that's a great way of looking at it Last but not least, uh, you're very active, you know, you're very visible and it's something that I think a lot of people as well too might struggle with figuring out what's the best way for me to, you know, learn in public. What are some things that work for you? Now, uh, tweeting works for me and talking to people, uh, as now I have crossed this of not talking to talking. So that works for me mostly because Uh, i can talk to a human in front of me saying that hey i have solved this 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 and they might give me some feedback which could be helpful or sometimes they just listen like a rubber duck you know rubber duck the bucking right so you can do that if you don't have a person but uh if you do it or if you write a blog or you can go live on youtube or just make a video and try to explain whatever you have learned that way uh, you can improve yourself see how your tone is or see how your explanation is so i made few mistakes that's fine i got to know that hey okay i need to explain this a bit more in a way that people would understand it's not how i understood but it's how other audience would understand so you will understand your audience and you will know the topic more deeply and then you won't be uh, able to like oh i don't know this how can i explain you won't be at that stage now if you understand your topic deeply just for the sake of your audience even if you're doing that that's great and that's wonderful advice and and like you said make mistakes not a problem we all make mistakes i make mistakes every single day of my life and and i don't plan on changing that because that's part of being human karuna this is wonderful advice i'm sure a lot of people are going to benefit from it so get prepared to get quite a few questions some more interactions either on slack or on twitter I'm very excited about seeing you in person in Amsterdam and KubeCon. All right, so see you soon. Yes, cheers. All righty. Uh, well, I think from the reactions, we all agree that Karuna is absolutely amazing. So let's give a round of applause. Very, very good. Absolutely love that. Now to keep it moving, some of you may have uh, had the chance to interact with Kunal Verma, who did a talk with us not that long ago about some of his experiences, but wanted to have a more direct conversation with him about the things that have worked, his learnings. You're going to get a lot of practical stuff here, just as you uh, experienced with Karuna. And I also shared her Twitter, so you can you can stay in touch with her that way. Um, that being said, though, let's get it over to Kunal and. We can take it away. I will make that bigger. So what are the correct steps to take on your cloud native journey? What are the different ways you can get involved? The different ways you can contribute. I'm very, very happy to be joined by Kunal Verma, who is one of our initial interns when we started uh, having folks, uh, get young folks in the community that are getting started on their cloud native journeys. And his journey has been exceptional uh, since then when we met when we met in KubeCon. Oh, seems like five years ago, but it wasn't. Anyway, Kunal, uh, well, you as always, and can you just tell folks who don't know you a little bit about your background and how your cloud native journey got started? Sure, uh, it's a pleasure, Bart, to always have a conversation with you. And hey, everyone, 
Uh, my name is Kunal and I am a pre-final year student from India. Yeah, I am a student right now and I'm an ambassador for the Cube Simplify community, which is, you know, which is started by Sayam Patak and we actually aim to you know, provide resources and guide people in the whole cloud native ecosystem. It's quite confusing in the start and yeah, we definitely help folks to get started with it. I'm also, uh, I also try to learn in public. So I share whatever I learn uh, with everyone on mostly on Twitter and trying to get active on LinkedIn as well. So if you want to reach out to me at any time with any doubt, you can definitely do so on my Twitter account. And apart from that, I'm, you know, trying to get my way into the DevOps ecosystem, trying to learn all the tech, which is around here. And we yeah, are trying to just explore because there is a lot to learn. So we yeah, are trying to just explore it. Uh, talking about my journey, how it got started, I think specifically in the cloud native ecosystem, it got started through KubeCon. And that was my very first KubeCon where I met Bart as well. So that was in, I think the early 2021, Bart, that was the EU one. Yes. I remember. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I got started, I attended that and it was first time virtual due to all the Corona stuff. So I attended that and through that I got, you know, introduced to all the cloud native community. I un understood the meaning of what exactly is cloud native. What does it mean? Right. All the DevOps ecosystem and the technologies that the companies are using right now. So I attended that. I attended a lot of sessions. A lot of things were uh, you know, sort of very new to me at that particular time. I didn't even heard about what exactly is cloud native and stuff like that. Right. So I attended sessions. I, you know, attended a mentorship session and Bart was our mentor. Very, you know, he uh, guided me all along the way and still is still guiding me. He's still guiding a lot of folks. So if you want to reach out to him, you can very well do so. He's a very kind person. And yeah, that is, I think KubeCon was one of the starting points for me. And then I got involved in communities, you know, attending meetings and stuff like that. I got started with contributing, you know, that was, I think the starting point. And then everything was, uh, I, I guess, laid out as a path for me, right? I got, re I reached out to people with my questions and yeah, that is, I think how my journey began and here we are today. All right, very good. And a lot has happened in a short period of time. That being said, you know, you interact with a lot of a lot of young people and, and you know, your example is very strong with the different areas, uh, different projects that you've been involved in and, and your commitment and showing up and paying it forward. At the same time, you know, what are some things, maybe mistakes that you could have made or mistakes that you see people often making in that process and ways to avoid them? What advice would you give there? I think the uh, there are a few, but the ones that I think are one of the most uh, important mistakes that people make. Yeah, mistakes are important. You should always make mistakes. That's how you learn. So I think the number one is the the people that I've seen, and I did in the it, in the beginning as well. I didn't start by asking questions in public. So I used to when I got started. If I just remember when I got started, I used to DM people whenever I had some doubt. I used to just reach out for them, search for their name in the community, and I used to reach out to them. Hey, uh, I am having this doubt, and please can you help me solve them? Now there are two problems that you know happens here. The number one is folks who are you know involved in these big big communities. Let's say Kubernetes, right? They are they also have the they might also have their full time jobs. So they are taking out their time for, you know, doing open source and, you know, community work. So the number one thing is that they might be busy and you won't even get a reply for around like two to three days. Uh, I'm talking about minimum. This is the minimum number, right? And the second mistake is that even if you get a reply, for example, you, you know, face an issue, you DM a person, you DM a maintainer, even if it, you know, it got solved, you may not get as many, you know, different perspectives if we compare it to asking questions in public, right? So I'll suggest, you know, if you are getting started, try to form this particular habit of asking your questions in public. There are a lot of public channels if you are talking about these open source communities. So join their Slack, join their community. Try to first introduce yourself that too in public so that everyone knows, okay, we have a new member and you'll definitely see the magic of these cloud native communities that how beautifully they welcome you. So this is how, you know, I got started. I will, I, you know, first introduced myself. I, you know, put, I put that, put that particular thing forward that, okay, I am new here. I'm a beginner and I want to learn. So this is something that uh, people will see in this particular whole ecosystem, the cloud native ecosystem, and they'll try to help you. Right. So introduce yourself in public, 
ask your questions in public and that's how you'll also learn to ask good questions now by good questions i mean you know every question is you know good even if you are just beginning you are not any question is not you know silly if you are you know just getting started but by good question i mean that for example you search for a particular technology right so while asking question you'll uh, also mention that this is something i searched on my end and i am stuck right now so how can you help me right so the person opposite to you will see okay this the the particular person has actually made some efforts on their own side to you know get past this particular error and they'll try to help you more so this is some this is any i'll say one example of a good question but you'll definitely get the hang of it when you will you know start interacting with people in public so that is one advice and second i'll say um, i'll say is be kind so this is something uh, that has helped a lot uh, you know from the starting you know i am uh, if, believe it or not i am a very kind person in real life as well i have not met anyone i have not even met bart uh, you know in person but i was i am a kind person and i try to be you know kind in the way that i interact with people you know so you have to be because we are in a online mode right we interact with people right now in a you know like on the, on camera so you don't really know who is exactly sitting behind the other side right you just you have to be considerate about their time you know you have to be considerate about that they are you know spending time guiding you for a particular thing so be kind in the way that you are interacting with it and be patient i'll say so these are i think a few advices that will definitely help you in the long way i hope that was that's great and you know the thing is those those two things about being patient and being kind neither one of those are technical and they are as important and i would say sometimes more important than the technical things and so mm -hmm. for folks that are young we know that your technical you know area will be as developed as it is in the best way that it can be but you no one's expecting you to learn everything in five minutes people would say i would would expect and certainly appreciate kindness and patience and kindness can also mean you know respect and like you said it's not that you are trying to disrespect people by you know sending them dms but then you realize oh these folks are also have a full-time job and they're doing this in their free time what are other areas or other places where I can go get my questions answered, whether it's in a Slack channel, whether it's on Twitter, uh, different ways that you can get those answers. And I also really like what you mentioned that a little bit of effort goes a long way. If people, the amount of times that um, seen certain questions and I respond with a screenshot of saying, you know, you can look for that in Google, say like, what is Kubernetes? It's like, well, there is a lot of information <laughs> about that. If you say that I looked and I'm not understanding this part, can somebody please help me? That's much better. Look at documentation. When you get stuck and be, can be more specific, then it's easier for people to help you. And luckily, it's very unlikely that your question will be the first time that it's being asked, meaning that someone else has probably uh, has asked that before. So whether it's on Twitter, whether it's in Slack, things of that nature, generally pretty quick that people will be able to help out. And look for opportunities where you can help too. And and you're obviously someone who's, I mean, like I said, who's doing that constantly whether it's on twitter whether it's in the cncf slack whether it's been on the glossary project we're almost we're almost out of time but i just want to ask what are what are the next steps that you're interested in taking what's on your radar i think uh, the next steps i'm working on right now so that would be developing my technical skills in the devops ecosystem so i am trying to you know follow a particular roadmap for this i am following sayam patak's roadmap you should definitely check it out it's very detailed and if you want to get started learning about you know different different technologies so that is something you should definitely check out i'll say because you know i have been guiding people in sort of a way of getting started but uh, i for my personal uh, in my mind i feel that there is a kind of a barrier between me and someone who's you know who wants to know more about rather than just getting started who is in the middle of his or her journey and they want to know okay how can i you know build projects how can i get started contributing in sort of a code perspective in a particular organization right so i feel that there i lack a bit because of my technical knowledge because i haven't been you know in touch with tech around the devops ecosystem so i am working currently on that you know trying to learn kubernetes in depth trying to learn you know all these technologies different different cloud technologies out there and then building projects and of course i'll always share this on public everyone knows on twitter what i am doing these days so yeah this is something i've been working on and of course contributing to open source projects is again something i have been looking forward to
yeah and podcast like these very, as well very so good. yeah i really hope to yeah yeah uh, well, you do a great job <laughs> i really hope to create content as well you know video content more because i want to improve my skills of talking to people on camera i feel i lack somewhat uh, in there as well so yeah this is something i've been looking forward to good well, anyway all those things are great and but as you show lots of kindness to others i think it's very important that you show kindness to yourself and you're doing amazing things you know people people know you and 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 know that you're the same person on camera as well as off camera <laughs> and i think that was a very good point that you made as well i think that yeah th- we w- there's always stuff that we would like to be doing more the question is when can i get the time what are the specific things i want to focus on it seems that you're quite clear about that so that being said kunal is wonderful catching up and i'm sure people are going to get a lot out of this you're quite easy to find your twitter twitter handle is right here but we'll share all the other links of of where you're at yeah. Keep simplify i think well. it's sure. yes, i am <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah, that's right there. <laughs> um, so that being said, thank you very much for your time and, and look forward to seeing your next steps and hopefully connecting in person at KubeCon. Yep, hoping for that too and really excited for DOK Explorers Day. So see you all there, everyone. All right, very, very good. I think we're all Kunal fans and for many different reasons. But next up, we've got Ritesh, all right, who did his talk about MongoDB and taking a look at operators. So let's keep it moving, folks. Keep those questions going. Keep those interactions happening. I'm going to share my screen, get his talk loaded up, and we should be good to go. Hello, everyone. Nope, that's not the one I was looking for. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, let me get back in here. All right, so I always have to be careful about which which one we're getting. Um, nope, hold on, let's take a look. Gotta make sure that everything's in the right place. Let's take a look. Let me get in there. Um, so let's see. All right. In the meantime, I'm gonna I'm gonna get the another talk going up so that uh, we don't have any further delays. Where do I need to take a look? All right. Cool. So we got um, she, um one second. Sorry. Like I said, this is why it's really helpful helpful to have somebody who's actually knowledgeable <laughs> to get all these things orchestrated. It's like a container orchestrator. The same way that we're talking about Kubernetes, um, keeping these things in mind for, for all the different technical aspects that we might encounter along the way. Let's see. Sorry about that. Let's take a look. Should be getting this together here. All right. I'm going to drop out of that. All right, we're going to go ahead and get Vamshi's talk uh, spun up, which is about real-time analytics. All right, so in the meantime, we'll get that, and we'll get back to Ritesh's in one minute. All right. Hello, and welcome to day. My name is Vamshi, and today I'm going to give a talk on the topic real-time analytics made easy with Kubernetes. So in this presentation, we are going to talk about what is real-time analytics, what is Kubernetes, what are some best practices and challenges while running real-time analytics with Kubernetes. So let's get started. So first thing first, let me introduce myself. My name is Vamshi. I'm an undergrad student doing my bachelor's degree in computer science engineering in Mahatma Gandhi Institute of Technology, which is in Hyderabad, India and I'm a DOK Explorer. And fun fact about me that I love to share my learning in the form of Twitter threads, uh, blog posts, or in or LinkedIn posts. So if you want to connect with me, you can connect with me via Twitter or LinkedIn. So yeah, that's about me. So let's talk about what is real-time analytics. So real-time analytics is a process of analyzing data as soon as it's generated. Instead of waiting for a batch of data to accumulate, it involves quick processing and analyzing data in real time or near to real time to gain insights and take immediate action. 
this type of analytics is used in various fields such as finance e-commerce and social media to optimize operations and improve customer engagement so that is about uh, real time analytics now let's talk about what is kubernetes so kubernetes is a open source container orchestration platform that helps to automate deployment scale and manage management of containerized application in uh, application in simple terms kubernetes is a tool that makes it easier to run and manage software application that are packaged in containers so if you want to learn more about kubernetes you can join our slack channel that is you can join our community dok community there you can uh, learn more about kubernetes so you know about what is uh, real time analytics and you know about what is kubernetes then let's talk about how does analytics fits into data on kubernetes ecosystem so analytics is a important part of data on kubernetes ecosystem kubernetes provide a platform for running containerized application including analytic world workload in a distributed and scale scalable manner kubernetes can be used to process large volume of data using containerized applications such as apache spark apache spring and this application can be deployed on kubernetes as containers and kubernetes can manage the scaling of the containerized based on the data processing workloads kubernetes provide a flexible and scalable platform for running containerized analytics workload so let's talk about some challenges while running real time uh, real time analytics uh, on kubernetes so we have three challenges that is scaling scale, uh, scaling complexity and data manage, data management for complexity real time analytics application can be complex with multiple components and dependency running this application on kubernetes requires good understanding of containerization networking and kubernetes itself for scalability real time analytics application needs to be able to scale quickly efficiently to handle very levels of traffic and workload for data management real time uh, real time analytics application offer requires persistent storage such as database or message queues managing persistent storage on kubernetes can be challenging especially for stateful application that requires data consistency and availability now let's talk about some best practices for running real time analytics on kubernetes so first we have containerization real time analytics application should be containerized using docker technology to ensure consistency and portability across different environment this also enables easy deployment and scaling using kubernetes next we have optimized resource allocation real time uh, uh, analytics application can consume significant resources so it's important to optimize uh, resource allocation to ensure efficient use of uh, resources last but not the least stateful sets so real time uh, analy analytics application often require persistent storage such as databases or message queues Kubernetes provides stateful sets, which are a way to manage stateful application with persistent storage, such as database or ma uh, message queues, ensuring that the data is consistent and available. Moving on the moving on the on to the next slide, uh, we have uh, this is a graph which says that uh, in DOK research report 2022, which clearly shows that. 67% of the data running on kubernetes is analytic workload of which 76 are leaders so running analytic workload on kubernetes provide organization with many benefits including scalability resource management portability integration with other tools automation and community support so you may ask how uh, community supports came into the picture so kubernetes has a large and active community which means that which means there are many resources and tools available to help the organization running their analytic work uh, workload on kubernetes so
uh, yeah this is my last slide now if you have any doubts regarding my talk you can join duk community where we have a separate channel called duk explorer you can ask there your questions your doubts regarding my talk or regard or regarding any talk in a duk explorer today uh, if you have any doubts regarding as specific to analytics you can ask Uh, your doubts in uh, in analytics channel we have a separate channel for analytics there you can ask your question regarding analytics and i will be answering those in no time and second thing you can do is you if you liked my talk you can uh, post a twitter thread or linkedin post regarding my talk that what you have learned from my talk you can tag me you can tag bard you can tag dok community We will be, we will be reading those posts and we will be retweeting or reposting uh, your post uh, in our in our uh, accounts. So thank you for watching my talk. Excellent job, Bamshi. Well done. Well explained. Great slides. Excellent talk through and through. Let's keep it moving. So, like I said, you know, Bamshi just talked about analytics. We've also had talks about streaming. We had a little bit about AI and, I, AI and ML earlier on the day, and now we're going to talk about operators, all right? So I'm going to start sharing my screen again, and we're going to take a look at uh, Karan's talk, all right? Let's discuss Kubernetes operators. So let's take it away. Go for it. Hello, everyone. Good day. I... Today, I will be talking about one of the topics that fascinates me a lot, that is Kubernetes operators. Before starting out, a quick introduction about me. I am a second year undergrad pursuing my bachelor's in computer application. I am a tech savvy guy who loves to learn and work with new and exciting technologies. I love to contribute and add value to projects. I am a student, a learner, and an explorer. Before starting with cooperators, let's do a quick recap about Kubernetes. Kubernetes is an open source software to deploy, scale, and manage. containerized applications anyway kubernetes kubernetes is great but with the power that kubernetes provides comes a lot of complexity so what was the problem that operators are created to resolve well kubernetes can manage and scale stateless applications such as web apps mobile backends and api servers without requiring any additional knowledge about how these applications work The built-in features of Kubernetes are de designed to easily handle these tasks. However, stateful applications like databases and monitoring systems require additional domain-specific knowledge that Kubernetes doesn't have. It needs this knowledge in order to scale, upgrade, and reconfigure these applications. To resolve this issue, in 2016, Core OS announced operators. To simply put. operators are software extension that uses custom resources to manage applications and their components operators encode this specific domain knowledge into kubernetes extensions so that it can manage and automate an applications life cycle let's discuss some of the features that makes operators important first operators extend kubernetes functionalities operators is a way of building an application and wrapping an application on the top of kubernetes behind kubernetes api operators extend kubernetes functionalities especially to stateful apps in a far more manageable and accessible fashion than before for application developers operators makes it easier to deploy and run the foundation services on which their apps depend on kubernetes operators take all of the knowledge about an application's life cycle that a devops team is practices manually and systemize it so that everything that can be automated is handled elegantly operators also help us to implement the selling point of kubernetes that is automation operators can also also simplify how you run kubernetes applications removing the complexity of managing the nuts and bolts of kubernetes and allowing you to to do in, in a repeatable manner so now you might be wondering how operator works 
operators connects to the Kubernetes API and watch for relevant events. They act as a custom Kubernetes controllers, introducing their own object types in the cluster that constantly compare the desired state with the actual state. The desired state is declared in a YAML file and is spread by the user creating Kubernetes objects as a custom resource definition, CRD. The operators run through its loop whenever and such an object appears, updated or deleted. Nowadays, operators are used to perform various functions and have many purposes. To name a few, operators are used for implementing both day one and day two tasks. Operators mimics how a op human operator would manage a service. It helps us to deploy, deploy apps, applications on demand. It watches the applications and logs the error if they found any. It performs backups and restoration and operators are most useful when it comes to hybrid environment management. Now let's go, now let's go through some of the statistics from DOK report. Well, according to DOK report 2022, Kubernetes is a cornerstone for DOK. Most organization, 66% use at least 20 of operators. The interesting thing is that the organization expect operators to perform at a very high level. They expect the, or, the organization expect the operators to handle all the day two operations. They expect to perform this at a very high level using the operator framework as a gradient scale. We found they found out that thirty six percent of organization expect operators to properly handle all day two operations such as application and storage lifecycle, backup and recovery failure. More, more than 40% expect advanced capabilities such as ability to provide matrices, alerts, log processing, and workload analysis. Right now, you can you can find at least 278 operators on Operator Hub. To name a few, there is Stu Operator, Kubeflow Operator, Cassandra Operator, Prometheus Operator, each designed to perform a certain task and function. With a plethora of operators available in the market, you can easily find one to perform a certain task. But what if you couldn't but what if you couldn't find the one that you are looking for? Then don't worry. You can also design and create the your operator with the help of operator SDK. So the major takeaways from this presentation is that operators are awesome. Yes, they are. Operators helps us to manage stateful application. It reduces the complexity and industry prefers to use operators. Do you want to know more? Are you curious? Or do you want, do you want to know more about any of the jargons or terminologies used in this presentation? And are you are doubtful on where to find the resources? Then don't worry. Hop onto the DOP Slack channel, Slack community. There is an inclusive and engagement, engaging community waiting for you. And do join the operator's channel to ask your doubts there. Thank you for sticking up with me. Hope to see you in the community. Thank you. All right. Absolutely awesome. We're getting, oh, sorry, I got to get my camera on. Absolutely love that. Let's keep it moving. So some of you may be aware of the Kubernetes release team. Well, you're about to meet the person who's been leading the comms team for the Kubernetes release team and her story, all right? I mentioned earlier, we'd be having folks from Women in, women in Cloud Native. The first uh, woman in Cloud Native uh, from the organization Women in Cloud Native that we're gonna be having is Harshita, all right? So I'm gonna share my screen and get to her talk. Keep the comments coming, folks. Keep the insights, keep the learnings flowing. We're getting towards the end. Let's finish strong. So getting started out in the CNCF cloud native journey for some folks can be a little bit challenging. Sometimes we even, well, actually quite a lot, we hear the word overwhelming about looking at the scene, you know, the, the landscape, all the different projects. We're here today with Harshita, who has an incredible story to share. Can you tell us how that story started, how you first found out about the CNCF, what your experience was like, and any tips you might or recommendations you might have for folks that are going to be doing the same thing. 
Uh, I started when uh, previously I was into web development, so I was learning all the front end and back end stuff. Then I came to know about the Docker and Kubernetes. And at that time, Kunal Kushwa uh, created a great YouTube videos, content about Kubernetes. And from Twitter as well, I came to know about the CNCF. And then I applied for the KubeCon virtual scholarship and I got the scholarship and then attended the KubeCon, came to know about uh, all the CNCF projects. And then I started contributing to open source. And yeah, so from there my journey started. That's fantastic. Um, and what was your first experience, you know, getting involved to start contributing? What was that process like? Uh, I When I was learning Kubernetes, uh, I started uh, going through the project Kubernetes. And at first it was overwhelming. Like for everyone, it is very overwhelming at first. And then uh, I started with the non-code contributions because I think at that time, uh, I was learning uh, some programming languages, so I thought like going with non-code contribution would be better for me. And then uh, I started with the documentation and then started contributing for the Kubernetes website. And then I applied for the shadow program and I got selected uh, for the 1.25 1 release and the Buck Triage team, which was led by Heba. And then uh, I was I get more involved in the securities from there. Very good. And shout out to Heba. She's an amazing person. Yeah, and amazing. It is amazing. It's like there are so many cool people in the, in the cloud native ecosystem and Heba is pretty competitive in, in, my, in my top five. Uh, with, with that in mind, okay, so you, you're getting you know, selected uh, to be a shadow on the, you know, on the release team. And but what are you doing now? Because you're all you've continued with the release team, but what have you been doing with yeah. the release? Uh, currently, I'm leading the uh, comps team for 1.257 release. Good. And so, what does that work involve? You know, because for folks that are out there that might be interested, what what are the things that you're doing? So basically, in comps team, uh, we are responsible for writing the mid cycle block, which goes out in in the middle of the release cycle, and the release block, which goes out at, at the date of the release, and then for all the enhancements that are coming up. So we are responsible for uh, publishing those features, feature blocks that are uh, that has opted in for this release. Very, very good. So once again, you know, you're touching the technical side, but then also the non-technical side in terms of these contributions. I think it's good for folks to know that there are lots of different ways to get involved. And since you mentioned Kunal Kushwaha, who's also participating in DOK Explorers Day, uh, you know, what he always says is the best way to get involved is to get involved. What are some tips or recommendations that you might have for folks out there? Because sometimes I see that there might be people that are kind of in a hurry that really want to do everything all at once. What have been things that have worked for you that you would recommend to others if they want to get more involved? Uh, the first thing that I would say, and it worked for me, is to get started is the hardest thing. So you have to get started, and then only all the things will go in the right direction. And uh, in CNCF and in any project, if you're contributing, it will take time to get used to it and to understand all this stuff. So you, you should not hurry about all these things. You should contribute and then learn while in the go. Very, very good point. And that's the thing. Enjoy the process. It's not a race. It's not a competition. Yes. And uh, with, you know, we got connected because of the work that you're also doing with women in cloud native. What's that experience been like? And, and what, you know, what have been the, the things that you've got from that? Actually, I recently joined women in cloud native community. So, uh, and it was started like a long time back. So uh, basically the work in a women in cloud community is uh, to, and empower women and we like, try to learn from each other, grow together, learn together. And we have some bi-weekly meetings where we uh, like discuss stuff and share what we have done and then clear each other's doubt. And basically to, uh, mm, I don't know the word I'm looking for is, uh, to means give recognition, recognition to the people that are there and for the all the good work that they are doing. I think it's, it's extremely important. Very often people are doing amazing things, but if they're not getting outside feedback and recognition of like, uh, the things yeah. they're doing, yeah, it might feel like, you know, oh, I'm just kind of here and I'm not really doing anything. Not true. Um, so massive shout out to Women Cloud Native. Glad that you're there. Anything that you have in mind for, you know, your next steps, things that you're looking forward to? 
Uh, yes, I am looking forward toward more code contribution in the community uh, in Kates and for the, all the CNCF projects and for GSOC that is uh, going on. So yeah, that's what I'm looking for. Good. So plenty busy. Arshita, thank you so much for joining us. And I think folks can learn a lot from your example. Don't be a stranger. You're pretty easy to find and keep up the amazing work. All right. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Cheers. Okay. So getting towards the home stretch. Thank you so much for joining us today, folks. I think it was a wonderful uh, last talk to have from Harshita. Excellent experience showing the power of being consistent, showing up, getting involved. We've heard that from other speakers. I want to take, uh, if you want to take a screenshot, all right, where, wherever you are, please turn on your cameras and, and you can, you know, take as many screenshots as you want uh, because we're finishing up for today. We'll be back tomorrow with more amazing talks from the DOK Explorers. We got lots of other folks as well, too, from the Cloud Native ecosystem. Some CNCF ambassadors are going to be speaking, other women from Women in Cloud Native, and of course, the amazing talks from the DOK Explorers. I love the comments. I want to get some of these things compiled of all the great quotes that you've taken from the different speakers we've had today. So whenever you're ready, take a picture. Yeah, yeah, yes, this is amazing. I love you all more than you could ever possibly know. This is one of my favorite things that I get to do and I feel extremely lucky to do so. Take care, have a wonderful day and we will see you all tomorrow. All right, take care everybody. Cheers. <laughs>